I put out new tribute. <laughs> what? <laughs>
The parking lot had no cameras, there appeared to be no witnesses, and back then there were no DNA testing capabilities. Police were desperate. They started just interviewing anyone they thought might be able to point them in any sort of tangible direction. They followed every tip they received, credible or not. They put witnesses under hypnosis in hopes of drawing out potentially helpful memories. And they even resorted to consulting with people who claimed to be psychic. But despite their best and their most unorthodox efforts, the case went cold. As if that wasn't hard enough on Michelle's family. Despite the lack of movement on the case, the one thing that never slowed down was the rumor mill. People speculated that the murder was a result of some scenarios that were incredibly hurtful to the family. None of which I'm willing to discuss here because they are not true, so why entertain them? And on top of that, some people actually called the family pretending to be Michelle just to torment them. How sick in the head can you actually be? Michelle and her mother had been incredibly close. Janet had suffered multiple miscarriages before finally giving birth to Michelle when she was 44 years old. The entire family considered Michelle a miracle, so understandably, these calls really broke them down. Janet had very little faith in anything following her daughter's murder. She wasn't even optimistic that the police would ever find her killer. And for decades, she was right. The case remained unsolved. There wouldn't be any movement in the case for 27 years. It wasn't until 2006 when the cold case unit at the Cedar Rapids Police Department received a tip connected to the case. And although the actual tip didn't turn into anything, it did lead to multiple pieces of evidence from Michelle's murder finally being taken out of the archives and tested for DNA. It was a shot in the dark, and I really don't think anyone was expecting very much, but miraculously, the forensic team was able to pinpoint DNA from Michelle's killer. This was huge. Up to this point, there had been nothing but the word of the suspects to go off of in order to prove their guilt or innocence. But now they had the ability, once and for all, to definitively prove if it was Andy or Kurt or someone else. Both men were immediately contacted and asked to submit a DNA sample for comparison, a request that Andy obliged with immediately. He submitted his sample at the first chance he got, and when the results came back, his DNA did not match Michelle's killer. He was telling the truth. He was innocent. So with Andy's DNA collected and ruled out, police waited for Kurt to follow suit. However, Kurt refused to submit his sample. Kurt's wife, who happens to be a judge, and his lawyer were both adamant that he not voluntarily hand over his DNA. And it looked bad. Police were now sure that they had their man. I mean, what innocent person in their right mind would refuse to do something so simple in order to rule themselves out as a murder suspect? Especially knowing the toll it had taken on his community to have this crime unsolved and looming over everyone for almost 30 years. Police told Kurt he could refuse all he wanted. It didn't matter. One way or another, they were going to get his DNA. The DNA that they now believed would surely connect him to Michelle Martinko's murder. But after a ton of back and forth, yelling, threats, and fighting with the Cedar Rapids Police Department, Kurt finally conceded. He threw in the towel and he agreed to voluntarily submit his DNA. They eagerly tested it against the sample of the killer's DNA. And when the results came back, it was finally proven that Kurt Thomas did not murder Michelle. He had been telling the truth this whole time and he was in fact completely innocent. And just like that, police were back to square one. Well, I guess not totally. Now they at least had DNA. They just didn't have anyone else to try and compare it to. So it's more like they were at square 1.5, give or take. They did try to run the DNA against every profile available in CODIS, as well as against about 100 other people who were brought to their attention for one reason or another. But despite their best efforts, they continued to come up empty-handed for the next nine years. This time, there was no movement on the case until 2015, when Detective Matt Denlinger decided to give the case a once-over. That's putting it extremely lightly. There was like 7,000 pages worth of notes regarding this case, and Detective Denlinger meticulously scrutinized each and every one of them. Matt had been just five years old when Michelle was killed, and coincidentally, it just so happened that his father was one of the original detectives on the case. He pored over these notes, many of them written by his own father, but just like everyone else, he could not come up with any additional theories or leads. All they had was this DNA. So he did the only thing he could do. He took the DNA and he ran with it. 
He contacted a company named Parabon Nano Labs that specialized in DNA phenotyping. And through speaking with them, he found out that the sample they had could be used to create an image of the killer based on clues it would give about appearance and ancestry. And this seemed like an absolutely massive breakthrough. I mean, technology this sophisticated had never been used on a case in Iowa before. And when the sketch came back, they were kind of surprised to see that it was completely different than the composite they'd managed to get back in 1980. And the company was able to age progress the man, as well as show him with different styles of facial and regular hair. The composite was released and it did generate some new leads, but it really didn't further the case. All of the leads were quickly and easily ruled out of having anything to do with Michelle Martinko's murder. It seemed once again that their big break had led them to another big dead end. It wasn't until 2018, following the solving of the Golden State Killer case, that the ball really got rolling. It wasn't until Joseph D'Angelo was identified that it became common knowledge that it was possible to track someone down with their DNA through a relative. And Cedar Rapids figured, hey, if they were able to track down JoJo through Jedmatch, can't, uh, we do that? Feels like we've been somewhere very near here before. Anyways, this revelation expanded the Cedar Rapids DNA pool to a database of over 1 million people. And bet your bottom dollar, they submitted their DNA sample, and it returned one single match. It was a partial match to a woman in Washington who shared DNA markers with Michelle's killer. The woman was determined to likely be the killer's second cousin twice removed. Which, I'm sorry, but what a kick in the nads. You think you've gotten away with murder for all these years just to be taken down by some relative you probably don't even know. All because on a whim, she spit in a tube because she wanted to know more about Grandma Irene's side of the family. I know this murder was committed before this type of technology even existed, but it's not like technology isn't evolving all the time. It's not like anyone can possibly believe that the investigative tools we have at our disposal at any given time are just gonna be it, right? What the hell was I talking about? Oh, right. From the match with the second cousin, they were able to build out a family tree, and eventually they narrowed the killer down to be one of three brothers. Jerry, Ken, or Donald Burns. The Burns brothers had grown up about 45 minutes outside of Cedar Rapids and were all immediately considered suspects. The only decision left to make was where to start. None of the brothers seemed much more likely to be the killer than the other ones. None of them had criminal records. None of them had any connection to Michelle or her family. At this point, they'd all settled down with their own families and had their own businesses. Just none of them seemed more likely than either of their brothers to be a cold-blooded killer. Regardless, this was the closest they'd ever been to solving Michelle's case, and they refused to let anything jeopardize that. They were very protective of this investigation and extremely tight-lipped with what they knew and what they were doing. They didn't just want to pick a random brother and show up at his house and start asking questions, because doing this could inadvertently tip off the guilty brother before they had a chance to figure out who it was. So instead, the brothers were placed under surveillance, and police began working diligently and covertly to obtain DNA samples from each of them. They started with Kenneth. For some reason, they figured he was most likely to have committed the murder. I don't know how they came to that conclusion, but they did. They tailed him for about a day before they were able to secure a drinking straw from him, which they were able to send to their lab for DNA comparison. Everyone waited anxiously for the results to come in. This was the first time they'd done this test that they knew the chances of it being a match were as high as one in three. And finally, when the results came in, they determined that Ken had not been the brother to murder Michelle. So now they were down from a one in three shot to a 50-50, a coin flip. Basically, one way or another, the next DNA comparison was going to reveal their killer. Either the next DNA test was going to be a match, or if it wasn't, it would mean it had to be the third and final brother. They decided to move on to Donald. They figured he was the second most likely of the three to have committed the murder. Again, I have no idea what led them to this conclusion, but they took it and went with it. They staked outside Donald's home and they just waited until finally their opportunity came, garbage day. You see, it's been decided that once your trash is left on the street, the police are free to rummage through it to their heart's content without probable cause or a warrant. Once you've discarded your trash to this extent, it's assumed that you have no reasonable expectation of privacy. So they waited for Don to wheel his little cans down to the curb so they could rifle through his trash in hopes of collecting some items that would be riddled with his DNA. 
they were able to get their hands on a toothbrush and a glass, both of which they knew would work to be analyzed against the killer's DNA. But once again, the comparison determined he was not a match to Michelle's killer. However, this time police weren't feeling hopeless or defeated. Quite the opposite, really. The only possible suspect left was Jerry Lynn Burns. Ironically, Jerry Bear was the brother that investigators had deemed the least likely to have committed the murder, so always remember, don't judge a book by its cover. Police were able to obtain Jerry's DNA for comparison after following him to lunch one day. They waited for him to pay and leave his table, and then they made their move. And armed with a little plastic straw, police were ready to take down the man they believed to be their killer. They sent it off to the lab, and sure enough, it was a perfect match. 39 years earlier, Jerry Burns had undoubtedly murdered Michelle Martinko. So police headed back to Manchester, Iowa on December 19th, 2018 to finally confront Jerry. They chose this day specifically, the anniversary of Michelle's murder, on purpose. They were hopeful it would elicit an emotional response from Jerry, ultimately making getting a confession much easier. So they headed out rolled up to Jerry's business, waltzed right in, and introduced themselves. And I'll tell you, I'd like to say I'd pay good money to have seen his reaction, but there's actually video footage of it. So one, you can see it for precisely zero dollars, and two, it's hella anticlimactic. Obnoxiously, he handled it super well. Hell of a poker face on that one. You would think, knowing you're about to be busted for a 40-year-old murder, your anxiety might spike just a little, but not Jer Bear, no. Old boy was unflappable. It was like they were talking about the weather. Obviously they weren't, but it's just annoying. You'd expect more of a reaction, wouldn't you? Doesn't matter. What matters is they figured it out and they were there. And they didn't waste much time. They pretty much immediately just flat out asked him if he knew who Michelle Martinko was or if he had any connection to her, which of course he denied. Jerry was also obligated by a warrant to provide an official DNA sample to police during this conversation. Obviously, he was unaware that police had already run his DNA, and he was certainly unaware that his DNA had already come back as a match to the killers. So they decided to go ahead and drop that bomb on him. And God damn it, if Jerry was not still totally unfazed. Despite their best attempts to break him or even to just elicit some emotion, Jerry remained completely stoic and police were disappointed, which aren't we all? I don't know why this man being calm bugs me so much, but it just like really does. And investigators were bummed because they'd really been hoping for like a full on outright confession and they didn't even come close, but it didn't matter. They had everything they needed before they'd even sat down with him. So they still proceeded to arrest him right then and there, sans confession. He was charged with first degree murder and in the blink of an eye, he went from feeling as if he'd gotten away with it to all of a sudden facing life in prison. Isn't that crazy? I mean, just to look at him, it is so hard to believe that he got away with murder for 40 years. He looks like the most normal, boring guy you could possibly imagine. Always remember, don't judge a book by its cover. Jerry's trial began in February of 2020 and was prosecuted by Assistant Lynn County Attorney Nick Maybanks. Maybanks had been just four years old at the time of Michelle's murder, but that didn't mean he didn't know exactly what this case meant to the people of Cedar Rapids. He felt a lot of pressure to prove his case and to secure a guilty verdict. And he felt the best way to do this was to present his case as sort of a journey back in time. By the time he was done, he wanted everyone in that courtroom to feel personally connected to not only Michelle, but also to Cedar Rapids circa 1979. He called Michelle's classmates to speak to her character and to what kind of person she was. He called her ex-boyfriend Andy. Yes, ex-boyfriend and ex-suspect Andy. He testified to what a wonderful and kind-hearted person Michelle was. Prosecutor Maybanks also called Kurt Thomas. Again, suspect turned prosecution's witness. As the last person to have seen her alive, Kurt testified to his final interactions with Michelle, as well as to her character and their friendship. I know it seems like Kurt did himself a huge disservice by initially refusing to give his DNA, but I honestly feel bad for him. He clearly harbors a lot of guilt and places a lot of blame on himself for Michelle's death for having not walked her to her car that night. He feels like if he'd simply walked her all the way to her car, that she very likely would still be alive today. Which, even if that's true or not, I feel like that's not something that he should feel guilty for. The only person who should feel guilty for what happened to Michelle is the person who actually took her life. Speaking of Jerry, the jury was also played the videotape of the conversation he had with police. However, probably the most damning portion of video they were shown was actually a recording taken in the back of the police car directly following Jerry's arrest. 
During this clip, Jerry is seen not professing his innocence. Rather, he spent the entire ride suggesting how easily a person could block something like this from their memory. And as if all that wasn't enough. <laughs> oh, Jerry's dumbass. They called his cellmate in as a witness, and he testified to the fact that Jerry had autographed a newspaper for him. The significance of this newspaper, you ask? Oh, nothing, except for the fact that the front page he autographed was a giant story about Michelle's murder. Just senseless. Even if his cellmate hadn't agreed to testify, they had the whole encounter on tape, so he was kind of screwed either way. But the informant did additionally testify to the fact that Jerry had told him, regardless of the outcome of the trial, he felt like he'd already won because he got 40 years to live a normal life, to build a business and to have a family. You know, how he got to live out all the opportunities that he viciously stole from Michelle. The prosecution then explained the DNA evidence to the jury, highlighting that there was about a one in 100 billion chance that anyone other than Jerry had murdered Michelle. They even wheeled in the dress she was wearing the night she was killed on a mannequin, and they showed the jury exactly where Jerry's DNA had been recovered from. His DNA had also been pulled off the gear shift in the car as well. The defense tried to argue that Jerry's DNA could have simply been transferred onto Michelle from something she'd touched earlier outside of the car, and they even had one whole witness that testified that this was plausible. Like, that was their only witness. Ain't nobody come to bat for Jer Bear. The defense also tried to argue that there was simply no motive for Jerry to have killed Michelle, and that because on paper Jerry had been an ideal citizen for all of his life, that there was simply no way he could be guilty of such a heinous crime. The trial lasted for just under two weeks, and on February 4th, 2020, after just three hours of deliberation, the jury found Jerry Lynn Burns guilty of the first-degree murder of Michelle Martingo. Because there is no death penalty in Iowa, a first-degree murder conviction carries a mandatory sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. On May 29th, 2020, Jerry's lawyer filed a motion asking for a new trial, claiming that his first one was unconstitutional, that his rights were violated, and that the court made a mistake allowing in certain pieces of evidence. Probably didn't want him to let that DNA in, but the motion was denied on August 7th, 2020, and Jerry was subsequently officially sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He is currently incarcerated at the Anamosa State Penitentiary in Iowa while he works on his appeals. He even retained Kathleen Zellner, the making a murderer lady. Yeah, he hired her firm for his appeals team, so I guess that'll be interesting. But for now, he is sitting in prison right where he belongs especially if you consider the fact that he could possibly be responsible for other crimes in the area that continue to remain unsolved. His cousin went missing on one of the anniversaries of Michelle's murder, and people think that's pretty coincidental and wonder if maybe he had something to do with it. And some people even speculate that Jerry could be responsible for the unsolved disappearance of Jody Hoosentrude. But these are just theories that at the time of this recording have not been substantiated in any way. And that about wraps us up for today. Rest in peace to poor Michelle and her parents. Unfortunately, they did both pass away before her case was actually solved. And this may sound weird, I guess, depending on what you believe in, but I hope somehow they have peace and closure. And I also hope that somehow Michelle herself knows just how much time, effort, and determination went into bringing her justice. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story. Before you head out, make sure you give this video a thumbs up. Even if you don't think it will, I promise it helps out the channel a lot, so thanks in advance. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel down below. I put out new true crime or creepy history content each week, and I would love to catch you back here in my next video. Until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye, guys.